Irish culture is one of the most recognisable cultures in all of the world. No matter where I go, I come across people telling me they love rebel songs. They love getting drunk. Is that what you think we are, poets and drunks? Well, you might be right. Well, today I want to teach you how this island of poets and drunks came up with such a strong identity and strong culture that has carried them into modernity. So to start things off, let me show you an example of what I'm talking about. This song is called Rocky Road to Dublin and really captures the vibe of Ireland. In the merry month of June, from me home I started, left the girls of June, nearly broken hearted, saluted father dear, kiss me darling mother, drank a pint of beer, me grief and tears to smother, then after eat the corn, leave where I was born, cut to stout black thorn to banish ghosts and goblins, a brand new pair of brogues, rattling o'er the bogs, frightening all the dogs, on the rocky road to double and one, two, three, four, five, hut the hair and turn her down the rocky road, all the way to double and whack for lolly in Mullingar that night I rested limbs so weary Started by daylight, me spirits sprite And ere he took a drop of the pure Keep me heart from sinking, that's the paddy's cure Whenever he's on for drinking To see the lassie smile, laughing all the while At me curious style, would set your heart to bubbling And asked if I was hard, wages I required Till I was nearly tired of the rocky road To double and one, two, three, four, five Hut the hair and turn her down the rocky road All the way to double and whack full ollie now this is a drinking song. You're supposed to go to the pub, or a party, whatever it is, and some guy will stand up and he'll say, alright, Rocky Road to Dublin. And he'll get everybody in a line, and everybody has to sing. And if you stutter, if you screw up a single lyric, if you stutter in any way, you have to drink more. So of course, the song never ends because no one can ever finish it because they're all hammered by the end of it, but I guess that was the point. But let's not be stereotypical, this isn't Paddy's Day. There's much more to Irish culture than drinking. I swear, I promise, I hope. Today I want to talk to you about our traditional music and how we created a cultural revival in Ireland that led to our great political revolution and led to our liberation on the world stage. So the structure of this video is I'm going to take you through the musical and artistic history of Ireland over the last 200 years. And so this structure is going to begin way back in the 19th century with the period known as Romanticism. And we're going to start off by talking about the general European cultural trend known as Romanticism, which Irish culture and the Celtic revival was born out of. We're going to start broad so we can get a feel for the century. Then we will go into the specifics of the Celtic cultural revival and how people romantically began to build up this new image of Ireland in response to the fact that they felt oppressed by the English because the English starved us with the famine. This trauma caused us to get motivated to do something new. We started to build up this romantic dream of Ireland, this image in our head of a free Ireland. We started to fantasize. And then over the course of the beginning of the 20th century, this vision, this romantic dream that was just a whisper inside of our minds, with all this music, now started to snowball and gather force and consolidate it into a nasty and harsh political goal. And I will talk to you about what that entails and then how we won our freedom and how our culture changed in modernity and became something much different than what it was before. A sort of peace-loving people, anti-conflict songs became very popular like U2 and the Cranberries, very famous stuff that you'll all be aware of and how that's left us where we are now. So let's dive in. Now you might say to yourself, Steph, why should I care about some silly island on the fringes of Europe? I'm an American from Mississippi or California. I don't care about stuff like this. I'm a British man. I don't have to pay attention to the nonsense going on in the small country. Well, listen, Joe Biden rules you. You are ruled by one of our operatives, one of our god kings, your leader, your Persian Xerxes. He is our guy. We have conquered you. Don't you understand? So you should pay attention. And for all you Brits, we all know that America are the big dogs who call the shots around here. You're, you're nobody anymore. You've fallen off, guys. We know that Joe Biden is out there telling you what to do. He's the big dog and he's our guy. We've won in the end. 
Oh, but what about Prince Harry? He's all ginger and strong and mighty. He's going to take over the world and conquer. Prince Dork, as far as I'm concerned. Joe Biden till the end of time. Joe Biden, we're going to get him on the anti-aging longevity stack that Brian Johnson is using. We're going to keep him blasted out of his face on whiskey so he lives for a thousand years. We're going to nuke every potato you have one by one. We're going to use the entire American arsenal to leave Britain without any chips at all. How do you feel about that? The Americans will chip in. Dude, what are chips, man? Do you mean fries? What are chips, dude? They're the things that made you overweight. <laughs> I've definitely scared off half the audience. It's time to get serious. All right, why should you care? We all in the West find ourselves in an era where culture is stuck, Americans and English included. We're all in this together, guys. Don't worry, I'm, I've got you. Big, big Joe, we, we've got you. We're taking care of things. We good Westerners have found ourselves quite sterile. We cannot produce original culture anymore. All of our postmodern art is just kind of confusing and silly. All the movies are reruns. We can't build these great statues we see in the Renaissance. We can't do these great artistic projects and architectural projects like building cathedrals. Something has gone wrong. And alongside this cultural malaise is a great political malaise, a sterility. There are no grand projects happening right now. We're not traveling into outer space. We're not going and fighting great wars. We're not going and taking over the world. We're not going and fighting great revolutions. None of that is happening. We are the middle children of history, as they said in Fight Club. Well, what I find so fascinating about the Irish cultural revival and the Irish political revolution is it's a story of small groups of dedicated actors in the world stage in politics and culture making something happen using the force of will to manifest a dream into reality, to make the world change, to imprint their hands upon history. Because the bare facts are that when push comes to shove, the number one feeling that hangs on people's souls in the modern world is the powerlessness, the inability for them to reach out and affect the world, the belief that they cannot do anything. And this is usually because of one thing, a lack of imagination, of misunderstanding the impact that you can have when you understand how generational snowball effects can have. These poets romanticizing in the late 19th century had no idea that what they were doing was generating the will that would lead to the freedom of an entire people forever. These are very serious things. And so many of us find ourselves in this middle stage, very similar to the 19th century where not much is happening, not realizing that we could be leaving ripples that could turn into tidal waves as time goes on. And so this is one of the major reasons that I want to start this by going back to 19th century romanticism. Because the mood in the European and Western culture at that time was very similar to where we are right now. Because back then, they had just come out of the age of enlightenment. This age was the rise of the mechanical, rational man. This was the age that set us up for the Industrial Revolution. This was the age where you had Descartes saying, my mind is separate from my body. My reason is sitting here as this vector and this force which is going to operationally deconstruct the world and turn it into machines to empower me to take over all of reality. This was the age where European man saw himself ascend and become dominator over the whole world through this reasonable way of thinking. This is the age where European man was coming across all these tribal people, coming across the East, coming across the, the, the mystical world of China and Japan and India, and understanding himself as different than these people because of this reasoning mind inside of his head, because of this mechanical science that they had set up. And for a long time, the Western people thought this way. They were the enlightened rationalists. And by the time the 19th century swung around, a lot of people of the age were getting jaded with this. They were pining for a better time. They were romanticizing about some time in the past where things weren't as stiff and stuffy and sterile and overly rational. They were looking at these monstrous cities rise up, getting filled with all these weirdos, these little golems, these proto-soy boy last men who were there pasteurizing their milk for the first time, cackling as they created the most ugly abominations known to humanity. And the expression of this sentiment and this mood came out in all sorts of ways. You have brilliant poets like William Wordsworth, who was basically like a version of Ted Kaczynski who didn't have access to dynamite, who just complained about how crap 
crap cities were all the time and said he loves trees and loves butterflies then you have the brutal cynical Arthur Schopenhauer who's complaining about the deviousness of nature and spitting at the celebration of the intellect that he saw so popular in the enlightenment age ah but the thing that you will recognize most clearly will be the music this is some of the best music western civilization ever produced this was when the west was reaching its peak of order of drama of style of identity romantic music is some of my favorite ever beautiful sophisticated and elegant sound this is a culture that is blossoming it is reaching its zenith it is the flower that has struggled out of the grass and now it is revealing the petals it has gone through the long centuries of the medieval age the renaissance the colonial conquests and finally now it sits at the top of the world confident that it is the world dominator believing through its science that western civilization was on the precipice of discovering the theory of everything without knowing that just around the corner in the 20th century all of that would fall apart Einstein would talk about relativity and ruin the pursuit of the theory of everything world wars would rip apart Europe and the colonial empires would implode Irish nationalism would be a part of that process so what you're hearing is the peak the naive peak Nietzsche would talk about this these people these romantics were actually the end of a great process and they weren't aware and i'm stressing these things because i think they deeply relate to where we find ourselves we are coming out of a long period of technological sophistication and we social media addicts find ourselves jaded with this utopia that we have created through the power of our technological engineering we find ourselves at the end of the great project of western civilization an awful lot of the mood that is out there right now is that the west is getting moved past we're letting go of all this stuff and now you notice an awful lot of people on social media an awful lot of people from the west are now beginning to romanticize the past just like these people were doing they're romanticizing a time before when everything was epic and everybody was strong and powerful and they're romanticizing nature a time when we could go back and live on the farm and we could go back to the medieval world and things would be simple and things would be better and things would be different it's important that you understand this so you can transport your imagination back into this era. This was the mood that was floating in the atmosphere at this time. Perhaps we find ourselves saturated and drenched with the same feelings that our ancestors once felt. That there is a great end of a process after happening and everything feels sterile. This great excited belief in technology and industry and rationalism turned out to be a little bit kind of bunkus. And now there's a big emotion inside of us that we want to escape to the past, go back to some romantic return to nature, or even more interesting, we want to weave dreams of great grand projects in the future. Because, of course, during the Romantic Age, this stimulated an awful lot of the nationalist fever inside of Europe. And to finally get us on track to our story, this was the sentiment that was looming in the air when the great catalytic event happened that set off the Irish nationalist project. And this, of course, was the famine. Right at the peak of the Romantic era, the Irish potato crop caught a disease and millions of people either died or left the country. And it was a devastating blow to the Irish population and people. 
Now, a big part of this famine was the British. As much as I'd love to blame them for conducting biological warfare upon our potatoes, they did not do that. It was not their fault that the potatoes caught the blight. But there was this attitude dominant in British culture, especially in relationship to the colonies like Ireland, which we might call laissez-faire capitalism. The sentiment basically is that the economy is a machine, a big mechanical rational process. And if the Irish aren't able to feed themselves, well, there's some type of act of nature getting instantiated in here. And this was obviously not what all British people thought, but it was floating around in many circles. Maybe it was the rationalized belief that some British people had so that they could, you know, get rid of some of the patties and have a good face about it or something like this. Now, this might be quite difficult for the Americans watching to understand. So imagine if you went to McDonald's tomorrow morning and instead of the normal cashier depressed with bags under their eyes about their job, standing there ready to hand you your like Egg McMuffin and Triple Big Mac for breakfast, there was like a British guy in some, you know, red coat with a big furry thing standing in front of you being like, hey, it's quiet. Well, you know, your economy is uh, not running quite as, as well as it could. So today you must starve. Sorry about that, chap. Have a good one. Yes, quiet. We're going to ship off all uh, the remaining fries in the back to India. No, actually to Manchester, where we will feel all of our plebs. Um, jolly good. Get the fuck out. Let's keep this simple. Imagine you have a bag of potato chips you're looking forward to eat for lunch and Russell Brand comes over and steals it every single day for five years. How mad would you be? Now, I say all this because this event fit so perfectly into the zeitgeist. You had this big, giant world empire with its mechanistic, rational way of thinking. No human soul or sentiment matters at all to these giant machine visions of reality that these people have. And it leads to this horrific orgy of suffering, this terrible, terrible experience. And of course, the response to this is to go on this visionary, dreaming nationalist movement, to go for this great, great adventure where these people who are oppressed by this mechanical style of thinking try to break free from the machine and go and define their destiny despite the great, big, overpowering Sauron of the world and go and achieve a national home for themselves. This really captured the soul of the times. You might say, oh, that sounds crazy, Steph. That suits you as an Irishman, that the Irish are the center of history. But in the next hundred years after 1845 towards 1945, what do we see happening? We see the Irish nation. We see Zionism. We see most of the European monarchies fall apart. We see the rise of German nationalism, Spanish nationalism, of Italian nationalism. Something was in the air. Grand projects were afoot. So this immediate trauma that the Irish went through stimulated a massive reaction. At this point, the Irish people started to get serious about breaking free from the British Empire. They'd been trying for a while, but this was a big deal. This is what got people feeling bitter, resentful, jaded. And it's very important to take a lesson from this. Trauma is not a bad thing. Trauma is something that you can transform into an advantage. When something bad happens, it can often act as a stimulus that will force you out of your comfort zone that you were stuck in before. And you see this with individuals all the way scaling up to nations. But it takes a long time to achieve anything great, often several generations. And most people don't have the discipline to even focus for several days, never mind several generations. But this is what the project of the Irish Celtic Revolution was all about. And so the start of this process was actually about lots of dream building. There was a lot of work to be done by artists and poets to do something which we call moralizing the people. You see, you've just been famined. Russell Brand has stole your lunch. You feel demoralized. You don't feel good about yourself. You feel like you were bullied. And you have a negative identity, a negative self-image. You think you're a loser. You think you're a failure. Everybody's been there. Well, the Irish people were in this space at this point. And what they needed is they needed to pick up a dream inside of their head, an identity, a vision of themselves that was positive, that was moralizing. And this is what many of our poets began to do. And so let's start with our national poet, William Butler Yeats, who won a Nobel Prize in 1923 for giving voice to a spirit of a nation. And his career is quite astounding to follow because it maps the transformation in the various moods that I am about to discuss 
as his poetry changes. The beginning stage of his career is full of this romantic, this calling back to the ancient natural world and the mystical world of the Celtic myths and whatnot. And then his poetry slowly evolves into being more jaded and grounded and realistic and political as we move into the 20th century. And of course, leading it up to that revolution. And Yeats is also very important to our story because he wasn't an Irish Catholic. He was an Anglo-Protestant Irishman. This shows us that this was not just the petty resentments of the silly Irish Catholics for having their potatoes stolen from them. This actually shows us that this was a part of a cultural trend going on in the European intellectual elite, because Yeats was certainly part of that. Yeats was well connected in London, he was really well educated, he was very articulate, and he even hung out in very high level occult circles like Alistair Crowley was a part of the Golden Dawn when Ye Yates was there and the two of them had this nerd off Star Wars magic fight where they started to cast spells on each other and stuff like this. It was a weird world back then, believe me. And so you can see in Yates's early poems him representing this trope, this romantic idea that we want to escape from the modern world and go back to somewhere beautiful, go back to your little mud hut where there is no internet so you can go monk mode. And this is exactly what Yeats's poem, The Lake Isle of Inish Free, is. It should be called The Lake Isle Where I Go Monk Mode, where I go and I say, screw the modern world, revolt against the modern world, not because it is bad, but because it is evil, and go into my cabin in the woods. William B Butler Yeats wrote, I will arise and go now, and go to Inish Free, and a small cabin built there of clay and wattles made. Nine bean rows will I have there, a hive for the honeybee, and live alone in the bee loud glade. And I shall have some peace there, for peace comes dropping slow, dropping from the veils of the morning to where the crickets sing. There midnight's all a glimmer, and noon a purple glow, an evening full of the linnet's wings. I will arise and go now, for always night and day, I hear lake water lapping with loud sounds by the shore. While I stand on the roadway or in the pavement's grey, I hear it in the deep heart's core. Now that's clearly a man who loves the land, loves the place he's from. He loves Ireland. And he's re-adding the sentiment, the, the magic to nature, to the natural world untouched. You all know this familiar image. He says, there midnight's a all a glimmer. There in his little mud hood monk mode cabin out in the middle of the back arse of nowhere in Ireland in the shticks, as we say. Midnight's all a glimmer. The stars are out. Even back then they were having this problem where they're in the cities and, you know, for whatever reason, maybe you couldn't see the stars because people were, you know, holding too many candles or something like this. And notice that he built his own little cabin out there in the woods. All these romantic poets, they're teetering on Ted Kaczynski territory. If they only knew a little bit more about chemistry, you know, if they only watched Fight Club or something like that and got inspired to start making soap, maybe they wouldn't be these celebrated poets that we all know. They would have had a, a different destiny waiting for them. And then on the opposite end, those Irish illiterate Catholics living in the mud who had just been starved in the famine, they are also making music that is romanticizing the world and the land of Ireland. They were bringing the land of Ireland back into consciousness and painting dreams and helping people remember, using the power of poetry to build up people's sentimental connection with the land. It's very important to keep that in mind. You can't die and fight for something that you don't love. You will not give your life for something that you don't love. These higher feelings can only be created through the most delicate and special means. And this is the power of poetry. And so we have a song here called Spansel Hill, which is representative of a struggle that many Irish people had, where they got booted out of Ireland. They had to go and hop on the ship and go over to America, where they were later become the president and rule the entire world. But until that point, they would go over to America and work. And while they're in America, they would fantasize, they would dream and memorize home. And they would write songs about this. And so we have many Irish traditional songs that have this sentiment inside of them. Last night was I lay dreaming of pleasant days gone by. Me might have been bound on a rambling, 
to Ireland I deploy I stepped on board a vision And I followed with the will Till last I came to anchor at the cross from Span You can see this deep romantic sentiment in the lyrics, the reinvigoration of the land, of the place that we call home, the creation of that place that you love. Last night as I lay dreaming of the pleasant days gone by, my mind being bent on rambling, to Ireland I did fly. I stepped on board a vision and I sailed out with a will and I quickly came to anchor at the cross in Spansel Hill. And so this guy's dreaming. He's in California. He's surrounded by these burger addicts. He doesn't know what to make of himself. And so he goes to sleep and says, God, I wish I was somewhere else. And he goes and he travels astral projection. You see, people were up to this mad stuff back then. You think like, oh, I went on TikTok and discovered astral projection. People were doing this stuff long before you even were a glint in your father's eye. And they were astrally projecting back to Ireland. And then going through the scenes, the entire song and poem is essentially him going to various parts of this little crappy little town in Clare <laughs> and going to all these parts and, you know, looking at the scenes, looking at his early childhood time, looking at the cross, looking at the pub, looking at, uh, I think it's uh, Farla, Father Mitchell or something like this, Father Dan, the church in Clooney, Martin Moylan. They're looking at all these characters and it's bringing life to the place. And this type of emotional, spiritual sentiment has a great effect. And so these two examples show us the foundations for what became the significant dream. Ireland is this beautiful, magical land, the land of fairies and leprechauns, the land of beautiful trees, green nature, the land of humble down toward hobbits and Sauron, evil, tyrannical England as the Sauron, the monstrous operations of Europe and world politics and the giant mechanical reality that's trying to suck you into Isengard and all this. Instead, we were the people people with the soul, the people from the land, the people connected with something that is special and delicate and pure. And to again stress this point, we're going to look at a song called The Fields of Atten Roy. Because in The Fields of Atten Roy, there is a line that says, you stole Trevelyan's corn, you'll hear it. And that line is referring to a man called Charles Trevelyan. And Charles Trevelyan was blamed as being a prominent cause of the famine because he was basically the man in uh, operational capacity over Ireland at the time and he had this mechanistic attitude he had this laissez-faire attitude this idea that okay well the economy is this perfect machine and if the Irish potato fails and they don't have economic market processes to back it up well then they deserve to starve By lonely prison wall I heard a young girl calling Michael, they have taken you away For you stole Trevelyan's corn So the young might see now a prison ship lies waiting in the bay. Here we go. Low in the fields of Athen Rye, where once we watched the small free birds fly. Our love was on the way We had dreams and songs to sing It's so lonely round the fields of that fly By a lonely prison The Irish head on that lad My god, that guy's seen the bottom of a fair few pints of Guinness I can tell you that for one thing Jeez, that's fetal alcohol syndrome, that poor man. He's an Irish legend, so I'll probably get battered in the streets for saying that. But is he, he literally looks cross-eyed, looking at his buck teeth and everything. This is, 
I know. I can imagine the English looking at us being like, "We just have to genocide these guys." Let's look at them. They're like, they're literally like monsters. Like, what is? They're like orcs or something like this. I don't know. Maybe, maybe they had a point. I'm not too sure. But hey, we make good music though, so you can't you can't really fault us on that side of things. So fair enough. I think uh, I think we're badasses. Look at those ears as well. Look, I say this though, but I guess I'm probably like you know 90 percent share my dna with this guy so it's in me too this is like this is like when you see the the idea of a a leprechaun this is literally like what people in the ancient world it's so funny how you see these myths this is what they were seeing they see this type of character and they say well that's a leprechaun you know they come across some type of scandinavian like the golden one or something like this and they're like well that's clearly legolas the elf or something like this so there you go but this is a wonderful song, beautiful song. If you ever go to an Irish uh, rugby match or football match or something like this and you hear them all singing, they will sing this song eventually. And the power in this song is monstrous. This is the type of thing that gets me riled up. This was like, I'm literally, I'll call up every English friend I have and be like, lads, invade now. We need a fucking fight. We need something to happen here because I am absolutely going for it with this. It is a magnificent piece of work. And it is, again, that romantic feeling. It's talking about this period. Trevelyan, oh, I stole Trevelyan's corn so my young might see the morn. And then what happens is they get deported down to Australia, to the prison island of Australia where everybody spends their day surfing. This is all you do in the colonies, isn't it? In California you surf, in Australia you surf. And so they get banished down to Australia. They live on this island at the bottom of the earth and they are trapped there. They are forced to slave away, never to see home ever again. Again, this same type of memory, this same type of cultural and romantic feeling that idealizes and builds up this idea of home, of Ireland, builds up the land, builds up the dream, the myth inside their heads. Nietzsche has a provocative passage in Beyond Good and Evil where he says that the Jewish Old Testament has men and stories and scenes and speeches that are so epic that they put even Indian and Greek literature to shame. And he often compliments the Old Testament and describing how much he prefers it to the New Testament because the Old Testament is the story of a people. And if you understand narrative and how human psychology works and how our world works, you understand that a people is not an insignificant fucking thing, despite what the modern world is trying to tell us. If you watched a movie without a hero, you would think it's a shit movie. A people are the main characters in the perspective we are using to look at history. The people are the heroes in whatever movie we want to look at history at. We can't see history objectively. That's impossible because it always requires characters. History is a story about us and we all are characters with our own perspectives. It's impossible for us to develop an objective history. That's a silly thing. You can't wind out of it. You need to be looking at it from somebody's perspective. And so when you read the Old Testament, you're seeing it from the Jewish perspective. And it's very compelling and very powerful. It's very, very strong. Now, what the Irish were doing, what these great poets were doing is they were giving the Irish people a perspective because when you have a perspective, when you have a movie, a story you're telling yourself about history and you're the people, you're the main character, you're the hero, that's how you have a destiny. That's how you have a future. Now, this poetic process really started to kick into gear towards the end of the 19th century. This romanticizing of Ireland and the building up of the Irish identity became more and more serious. And you started to get more and more elaborate projects getting put into gear in order to make it happen. For example, Yeats's patron, Lady Gregory, a wonderful woman, went out, again, an Anglo-Protestant. So she's some fucking rich bitch up there in the up in Dublin, you know, thinking she's all class, snotty, blue-blooded, uh, you know, above us all. And she got down and got her dress dirty and went out to the West, went out to the, the, the back arse of Ireland, went out to the, I don't know, maybe would the Americans call them the rednecks of Ireland? I'm not sure that's the best analogy, but she went out there anyway. And she goes and she finds the old Irish people in the pubs in the middle of Galway and Mayo, where, you know, basically there's no land anymore. It's just all rocks. And she finds the people telling the oral traditions of the old Irish myths from before Christianity. This is how old this stuff is. It's an oral tradition that has survived the Christian church coming into Ireland. That's old and it's unbroken because it's that old and she sat down and she went through the stress and effort to collect these stories and document them and this gives us one of the best source materials on Irish mythology this is why for example Irish mythology 
is so complete compared to many other European pagan mythologies because most of them were just were basically forgotten. But this one survived through oral tradition very, very well and through people like her putting immense effort to try bring this up. Now, another gentleman who contributed greatly to this project was called Herbert Hughes. He was a composer who went out and found old Irish songs that were being sung in the pubs and he composed them and put them in written music and adapted them so that they were sort of familiar to people for the modern age. For example, he famously took She Moved Through the Fair, which is an absolutely beautiful song. Now, the version I'm going to show you is sung by Sinead O'Connor, and it's worth mentioning that Sinead O'Connor died a couple of days ago. And that was a big part of what inspired me to finally sit down and do this video. The video has been floating in my head as an idea for a while. And then when I saw her passing, I kind of took it as a sign. I'm going to get kind of mystical and Jungian here, but randomly, about three, four days before she died, I sat down and I decided to listen to She Moved Through the Fair. And I had not listened to Sinead O'Connor's She Moved Through the Fair in years. Because Sinead O'Connor's had some kind of crazy opinions the last while. She's gone to convert to Islam and all this. And I stopped really like paying too much attention to her. But nonetheless, it popped into my head to sit down and listen to this song one day in the middle of the day. And I sat down, fired it up on the old YouTube. And... As I was listening to it, a huge emotion rose up in my chest. I'm going a little soft boy here, so you're going to have to forgive me. But I started to cry. And I was crying in a very tr deep and tragic way. I kept on having the thought that Ireland is dying. And I'm talking to you about this problem we have in Western culture where we're sort of sterile, our identity is getting washed away. And I can only describe as the feeling of what this was saturating me. I felt something crushing and depressing and I was looking at her. She's so beautiful. She looks like an angel. And of course, the song is so forlorn. It just dragged me into a heavy heart. And I didn't think much of it. You know, I haven't cried in a long time, but I sort of said, you know, maybe it happens. Maybe I needed to get it out of me or something like this. And then only three or four days later, the news pops up that Sinead O'Connor died. And that hit me like a truck. That is the type of thing where I sit down and I pay attention. Very much an educated Jungian here, you know. And I know that the unconscious mind, especially the collective unconscious mind, works its magic through hunches and feelings. That's how it pulls its strings. It makes us feel things. It inspires us. It connects us. And I'm fucking no mystic Steph here. As I said, I'm not trying to LARP as some type of receiving messages, the Oracle receiving messages from space or something like this. But I don't know. I got hit by something. I take it serious. I've had these thoughts, and so I think as an act of duty to the Irish collective soul, I must schizo rant to the internet about my thoughts on the, the revolution of the Irish. So here's Sinead O'Connor, which she moved through the fair. Rest in peace. My own love said to me Oh, 
What a beautiful song. I know for certain that when I die and I'm getting lifted out of my body into the astral plane, up towards heaven, getting lifted through the clouds, I won't hear choirs of angels like you normies. I won't be hearing, you know, Gregorian chants. Instead, I'll be hearing this, maybe even sung by Sinead herself, echoing through the sky for eternity as I'm lifted up to the gates of heaven. And I stand in front of St. Peter and he looks at me and cocks his eyebrow and says, man, you're not getting in here. You spent your whole life ranting about Nietzsche. You're going to hell. Nice one. So that leads us to a very interesting pivot in the story. Because up until now, we had an awful lot of romanticizing, an awful lot of dreaming. But now the mood is going to change. Now we have these people gathering all these dreams, all these mythical old stories, all these old airs. But all of a sudden, we get a generation in the early 20th century who are ready to use this stuff. The time for dreaming is over. No longer do dreams matter to these men. They want realities. And they start to get a sniff of a tactile, real political goal. They start to believe that they can become free and have a country of their own. It's no longer a dream. They start to say it can happen. And now these dreams, all this cultural capital, all this strong moralized identity that has been built up over the decades, now these men are ready to seize this power and use it to gain an actual victory in the real world. And we start to see it with these cultural trends. All of a sudden, we see men taking these traditional songs and not turning them into these beautiful, airy-fairy cultural assets that we can build up. Not that there's anything wrong with that. But instead, they take these traditional songs and they transform them into fighting songs, rebel songs, songs that you can use to march an army across the country in order to go into open combat with a rival army. And this happens at the beginning of the 20th century and we see a generation of great political organizers show up. All of this work building up a moralized identity had been done for decades by the generations of poets that came before them. And now a crop of young men show up who have their heads clear. They are moralized, they believe in themselves and they have a vision and they want to see it through. You get a character like Podrick Pierce, a Superman if I've ever seen one before. And he goes, he is a political organiser, a man conscious of military operations, and of course, a very educated and intelligent man. He writes sci-fi novels, he does all sorts of brilliant things. And he takes one of these traditional airs called Old Roche de Vahawalia, and he turns it into a marching song. He modernises it so he can get it into his Irish Republican army and use it to make a show of force. So have a listen to this. This is a song in Gaelic Irish. This is a song that you Brits and you Americans will not understand. This song, we can talk about you in this language and you wouldn't even know what's going on. This is our secret code. This is how we communicate with Joe Biden on the radio to confuse the FBI and all your defense departments trying to protect you from the Irish takeover. This is the truest Irish spirit. And this is a fantastic song sang here by a old gentleman from Galway. She the Vahel and Wellid War, the Bay or Grahu, the King is on. Quail we brought, she Studio till there's no golly. Or, oh, she the Vahel, or, oh, she the Vahel, or, oh, she the Vahel. In a shell, a good tower. Tagrai in a wheel like a jeweler sala. Ogly at a melip margarda. Quilly at him sneer front not spine. He's quidditch yet a wagger holly. Or, oh, she the vahoala. Or, oh, she the vahoala. Or, oh, she the this is so powerful I don't know how to describe this but I feel tingles in my hands I get absolutely riled up because of this man 
Um, and this is old school. Like this, that again. Like look at the the phenotypes. Look at the phenotypes in these Irish characters. Like this man's from Atlantis or something like this. Look at that head. Look at the size of those. Look at those ears. We've definitely got some. I have those big ears too. Look at this. And maybe you can't see them. You know, like I, I don't know what's going on here. We've got we've got something going on here. This is this is you see this type of character, and he's probably like six foot five as well. You know, drank nothing but milk his whole life. Look at the size of his head. Apparently, the Irish people have like well, some of the biggest skulls in in the uh, in the European continent, probably because of the amount of milk we drink. So, and this gentleman singing Oroshi de Vahawalia. You might be asking yourself, like, why is this significant, Steph? Like, why are we talking about music? What does this have to do with anything? Well, you see, if you're going to fight a war, if you're going to fight a revolution, if you're going to make something happen, you need to be ready to fight. And if you want to fight, you need to be ready to die. When you have a load of soldiers sitting in a ditch and they're saying to themselves, why am I suffering? To live is to suffer. Why am I here in this ditch? Why am I risking my life? What am I risking my life for? They need to believe. They need to have something that they care about. And oftentimes, in order to keep them moralized, to keep them believing, to keep them in good spirits, things like this are key. These rebel songs connect them to their deep identity. These are outpourings of the Irish collective unconscious, the Irish racial sh soul. This is sang by my ancestors, by my grandfathers. It echoes through my DNA. It unlocks something inside of me, emotions that no one else can feel. And when these soldiers are sitting there and they're fighting against the greatest army that has ever existed in the world with superior weapons, with more numbers, more or training, more organization, more funding, more intelligence, with cannons, when we're fighting against those guys, the only edge we have is we want it more than them. And so you can see in the art and culture the beginning of the consolidation of the will. First, there was the trauma of the famine. Then there was the romantic dreams and the will was built up. The moralization process began. People began to get inspired. They began to develop a story and an identity of who they are. And now it is beginning to consolidate and get focused like an energy. Now it is starting to turn into something that people can cash in. All this effort over generations is now arriving to a point where it can be transformed into something. Nietzsche said that great men and great ages are always the result of a long period of accumulation. The great age is a day when you get to spend all that will. You give over all the efforts and labors of generations and decades over to a superman and he gets to do what he wants with it. He gets to spend it. This is what happened in France. France built up all that energy over the centuries and gave it to Napoleon to try create a European French empire. An enormous amount of capital, will and intelligence was stored up in Germany and passed through Wagner and Bismarck and Wilhelm I all the way to Hitler where the Germans were spending that energy trying to manifest the German Reich. And what you saw happening in our Ireland was a similar process. For generations there was energy and will being built up and finally in the early 20th century a set of men showed up who were ready to cash it in. Excellent men who were ready to take the risks and the sacrifices that were necessary to turn the will and the energy and the potential into an actuality to make something happen. And you start to hear this in the music. The music begins to grow teeth. And this is where we see the rise of the political rebel song. <laughs> A stone that glen one Easter morn To a city fair or die Their arm lines of marching men Its squadrons pass me by No pipes did hum, no battle drum Did sound its loud tattoo But the angelus bell or the lengthy swell Rang out in the foggy That's fighting music right there. That's the type of stuff that gets you riled up. And you can see, you can see the energy is heavier and harder in this. 
people are now they've got that bite and edge and now the songs the story of these songs is from this military period of 1916 they're talking about this stuff the, the poetry that they're writing about is this war is this battering is this fighting and again this was a traditional song that I believe was dramatically changed and adapted to the modern world and all the lyrics were changed and even things like the melody so it changed quite a lot but this is showing you where our heads are at now. And um, here's another example from the Wolf Tones, very, very famous one. And this is talking about these people called the Black and Tans, who the Black and Tans was the uniform they made. So they, they wore black and they wore tanned um, uniforms, basically like, you know, desert tan and then like black sort of balaclavas and stuff like this. And so the uh, obviously the cry is, come out your Black and Tans, come out and fight me like a man. Very famous song. I was born on a Dublin street where the loyal drums did beat. The loving English feet they walked over us. And every single night when me da would come on tight, he'd invite the neighbours out to with this chorus. Come out, you black and tans, come out and fight me like a man. People listen to hip hop, they listen to like call out tunes and hip hop, you know, rappers like bickering at each other. This is literally an army calling out another army. What is better than that? This is an army dropping a track saying, yo, come and fight me in the streets with weapons. Not saying any of this crap where you're like, oh yeah, bro, yeah. I'm a bit, I'm, I've got more followers on IG than you do, bro. This is the real type of call-outs. These social media call-outs where you see streamers bickering. This is a revolutionary rebel army. This is like the Taliban dropping a rap song, telling the American government to come and fight them. That's what this is like. Do you understand the energy in this? And so now, motivated by grand dreams with a crystal clear project in their sights, led by great men of action, Podrick Pierce, Michael Collins, the Irish people are ready for a fight. And 1916 proves to be the pivotal moment, almost as pivotal as the famine itself. In the middle of World War I, the Irish throw a rebellion. And of course, understandably, the British are having none of this. They feel betrayed by the fact that the Irish would stab them in the back while they're out fighting against Germany. And worse still, they have a lot of Irish people in their army that they're fighting on the continent with and they're worried that revolutionary sentiment might spread. So they brutally crack down on this revolution in Ireland. And so their response is to stand the leadership of this revolution up against the wall and fill them with bullets via firing squad. During this, many great Irishmen and the great Podrick Pierce himself is executed and the Irish people freak out. This Easter Rising was not that popular, but after these executions, everyone in Ireland believes that the British took things too far and sentiment starts to boil over. And this marks the beginning of the end game for British rule in Ireland. Now let's go back to our buddy William Butler Yeats to analyze this because now, William Butler Yeats's poems are no longer about frolicking around in his mud hut, watching self-improvement YouTube, taking cold showers and going monk mode. Now, his mystical Celtic love of the land poetry has moved towards this tactile, down-to-earth, clear-thinking, clear-headed political poetry. He writes a poem after this called Easter 1916. He says... I have met them at the close of day, coming with vivid faces, from counter or desk among grey, 18th century houses. I have passed with a nod of the head, or polite meaningless words, or have lingered a while and said polite meaningless words, and thought before I had done of a mocking tale or a gibe, to please a companion around the fire at the club being certain that they and I but lived where motley is worn. All changed, changed utterly. A terrible beauty is born. Now, what is going on in this verse is quite a lot of things, but he 
Yeats was not actually a big supporter of a crazy Irish revolution. He didn't like the idea of them throwing this revolution in 1916. He understood that this would piss off the British and he was trying his best to find a political solution, not a violent solution. And he could see how things were beginning to escalate. And he was always, he had his connections in London. He was this fucking Anglo, you know. And he, he had his connections and he was trying to make it work in the most suitable way possible. But once he saw the executions of 1916 happen, he began to understand that it was over. This was the conclusion. Now, his experience running up to this is that he might have been seen as a pacifist or maybe a sympathizer with the English. People wouldn't have trusted him that much. A lot of people bickered about him quite a lot. And his experience walking around Dublin would be meeting these characters, you know, meeting the revolutionaries. They would come in with their vivid faces, eyes wide, ready for revolution. They, he, they would pass by and maybe they'd nod at him politely, but, you know, it's not that type of nod where they're like, oh, my friend, it's sort of like cold, dead eyed, like you fucking untrustworthy bastard. We, we know where you stand. Polite, meaningless words. Throwing a polite, meaningless word out. Good day, sir. Hope you're well, sir. This type of stuff. Because he could, he could notice the energy around him. He noticed the people were getting anxious. And he noticed that these people were, these political revolutionaries, they were aiming for the jugular. But he wasn't quite on board. But now all of a sudden, he was forced to confront this reality. Now all of a sudden, whatever these guys were doing was now the destiny that they had to follow. All other options, all other possibilities, all other romantic notions were closed off. Action had been taken, decisions decisions have been made, and they are now on a clear, definite path. Potential has now been actualized. There is no going back. A terrible beauty is born. And this is exactly what a dream is, isn't it? Dreams are all pretty and nice until you actually have to make them. As Nietzsche says, all great things on earth are drenched thoroughly in blood for a long, long time. That's a terrible beauty. And this is what was happening with Ireland. The dream free Ireland the dream this whisper of this land of ours this beautiful land that stood on its own two feet was about to be born and all birth involves blood the next verse goes that woman's days were spent in ignorant goodwill her nights in argument until her voice grew shrill what voice more sweet than hers when young and beautiful she rode to harriers this man had kept a school and rode our winged horse. This other, his helper and friend, was coming into his force. He might have won fame in the end, so sensitive as nature seemed, so daring and sweet as thought. This other man I had dreamed, a drunken, vainglorious lout. He had done most bitter wrong to some who are near my heart, yet I number him in the song. He too had resigned his part in casual comedy. He too has been changed in his turn, transformed utterly. A terrible beauty is born. Now what Yeats is talking about in the second verse is specific. People, he's getting into more detail and with the genius of his poetry, he begins to show how these people's more dreamy and idealistic private nature, the romantic side, is quashed by the public image that they have to present. Very interesting motif, isn't it? But this seems to be a motif perhaps of Yeats's life himself. We have Constant Markievicz. What a fucking name, you know? And this is a woman that is involved with this. And he's talking about her in the first couple of stanzas where he's saying how her voice is shrill. She's up there and she's roaring to all these crowds and roaring about the revolution. And of course, this public revolutionary spirit that she has contrasts to what Yeats knew about her because he was a longtime friend and he remembered hanging out with her and she had this tender demeanor. She was beautiful and especially when she was younger, you know, she was a much more dainty, I guess you maybe even say feminine and now she's become possessed by the revolutionary fervor. She's become this shrill, screeching witch. What has this done? What has this this great dream that we're trying to manifest? We've gone from being these idealistic, beautiful kids talking about Ireland and the land to these roaring monsters in the streets calling for blood and sacrifice. It was all so beautiful until it came true. He brings up, for example, Podrick Pierce himself and talks quite pointedly about Podrick Pierce's bombastic and powerful presentation, his, you know, arrogant way of presenting himself. And he points out how 
Pierce was a sensitive young man. He was daring and sweet in his ideals, the way he thought, his romantic visions. You know, Podrick Pierce would sit down and, and ponder and think. This is all quite fascinating and, and interesting stuff that he has this kind, introverted, sensitive soul. He's a sensitive young man. But then as he goes and participates, participates in, the, in the public world, he has to go up and be a revolutionary, a proud, strong, unyielding, undoubting revolutionary fighter. And of course, all this, these beautiful, tender ideals that these guys have of this free Ireland, of you know, solving the problem of Ireland, of saving the land, these delicate, beautiful thoughts had to be manifest with force, had to be manifest with violence and blood, because all great things have to transform people you are transformed utterly by your ideals something to think about and a terrible beauty is born out of this poetry hour with steph continues here is stanza three of william butler yeats's easter 1916 hearts with one purpose alone through summer and winter seem enchanted to a stone to trouble the living stream the horse that comes from the road, the rider, the birds that range, from cloud to tumbling cloud, minute by minute they change. A shadow of cloud on the stream changes minute by minute. A horse hoof slides in the brim, and a horse plashes within it. The long legged moor hens dive, and hens to moorcocks call, minute by minute they live the stones in the midst of it all. Now this stanza is quite beautiful because on a surface level, Yeats is becoming a fucking Buddhist again. He's going out into the, the mud hut and he's sitting there and looking around him. He's becoming like Heraclitus and being like, thou can only walk into that river once and not even the same river and all this nonsense, you know. The river flows, everything changes, everything transforms. Perhaps it's also a slight elaboration on our idea that, you know, the, as, as things move forward in time, things always change. But he's speaking also about the power of the revolutionary spirits. Hearts with one purpose alone. That's not transient. That's a vector. That's a force. That's something that is consequential. That's something that's real and tangible. The stone at the end of it. Everything else is swirling in samsara. The horfs, the horfs, the horfs. <laughs> the horses are plattering around the stream, the clouds. All of this is changing. It's like, for example, the Irish population themselves, probably not too concerned with these things. They don't hold any strong convictions. But this small group of real revolutionaries with a steadfast, strong will, with a perfect anger, with a screaming heart, who actually mean it mean it all the way to the death mean it to ultimate consequence this is force this is something that is real this is something that is tangible it punches through all this transience and all this buddhist uh, you know samsara nonsense that has no effect and it makes things happen it has consequence and it has force in resistance to the world of change and the last stanza the fourth stanza begins with too long a sacrifice can make a stone of the heart. Oh, when may it suffice? That is heaven's part, our part. To murmur name upon name as a mother names her child. When sleep at last has come on limbs that had run wild. What is it but nightfall? No, no, not night, but death. Was it needless death after all? For England may keep faith. For all that is done and said, we know their dream enough. To know they dreamed and are dead. And what if excess of love bewildered them till they died? I write it out in verse, Macdonough and Macbride, and Connolly and Pierce. Now, and in time to be, wherever green is worn, are changed, changed utterly, a terrible beauty is born. And so moving on from verse three, he is talking about the convicted heart, the stone that resists all the transformation and change. He begins this stanza with the concept of sacrifice and the notion of the heart. Too long a sacrifice 
can make a stone of the heart. Too long commitment to these big ideals can destroy something inside of you. Because what are we talking about in the first verse? We're talking about these idealistic young guys. Yeats flittering around, writing his little poetry, sharing it with Constance and Podrick Pierce, the sensitive young man. And all these dreams that they would share about the beauty of Ireland and revolutionizing the culture and the possibilities and the visions and the dreams. And of course, once the vision consolidates into something real and you actually have to make it happen, you have to commit, you have to crush that visionary dreaming part of your mind you have to crush off that sensitive delicate idealism out of you you have to become a realist and that's necessary to do things to make things happen yates didn't go and fucking die for the people somebody else did and he's well aware of that but he's also aware that too long a sacrifice too much pressure too much your yearning and grabbing for this ideal it can kill something inside of you it can make the heart a stone and this becomes the thing that Yeats ponders in the middle of the last verse. He is saying, we know their dream enough to know they dreamed and are dead. But what if excess of love bewildered them till they died? What if the dream bewitched them? What if the dream flashed in their minds and got them all confused and caught up with this heady idealism and destroyed them? The dream possessed them in a way carol jung made this commentary about adolf hitler he said that adolf hitler got possessed by wodan possessed by the visions and it took him and used him for whatever ends they were and perhaps you know you could say were, was was hitler making his decisions or was wodan leading him by these visions that he was filling his mind with and maybe you could say the same about these guys mcdonough mcbride Connolly, and pierce these revolutionaries with their dream of ireland were they possessed by that were they caught so much in their idealism that it was transforming them turning them into hard men who lost the very ability to be idealistic that set them on this path and right at the end of this verse Yeats resigns to the reality he becomes fatalistic he may have been a bit tepid he may have not got on with these people he may have found it frustrating that they lost their earlier idealism that he perhaps has held on to a little bit more and now he accepts that he is a part of history he is going through this process there's nothing he can do about it he is a participant in this and these men have given their life up for a great ideal and for better or for worse this thing is about to get born perhaps he can find and feel the sentiment of the people around him there is going to be consequences to this domino that has been tipped the dominoes are going to fall and he realizes now that the idea of the green uniform the, the Republican nationalist uniform. We now know that this means something completely different. This is a whole new symbol. It is never the same again. Now this means you are fighting for against an oppressor. Now you know that these Brits are not here to be your friend and offer you these little crumbs off the table of home rule and stuff like this. Now you know that these people will crush you with absolute violence if you step out of line. They are the enemy and you are now a revolutionary in green shirts. From that point on, nothing would ever be the same again. And the dreams that have been built up over centuries were now consolidating into a specific destiny. I know I've said this, but I'm repeating this because you need to think about this. All of that potential, all of Yeats' high hopes was now on the funnel to actualizing into a vision. It's going to happen. Now, this is a part of the domino effect and whatever version of those dreams is going to be put into place depends and hinges upon the next couple of decisions and actions and events that come over the next five years. You're running into the end game. Now the momentum is picked up and there's no stopping it. It is happening. A terrible beauty is about to be born. And so in 1919, the year after World War I ended, the Irish War of Independence kicked off for real. And what happened here is the Irish Republic declared that it had its own government and therefore it had its own army, the Irish Republican Army, which is where we get the word IRA from. And this IRA conducted a mass guerrilla warfare campaign against the English. And this relentless guerrilla warfare and pressure worked. The British could not deal with this amount of hostility and their administration began to collapse. They eventually had to move out of the country and remove their army. And this led to us getting our country for the first time in 800 years and us becoming free. But 
there was a condition. Michael Collins was sent over to make a deal. You see, the British are very smart. They brought Michael Collins over and they said, you can have the south of Ireland, but we want this little piece up in the north. And we're willing to give you the south now and then we will remove our army from your lands. We'll just move some of them up north. That's the deal. Now, of course, Michael Collins knew that if he took this, he'd get in a lot of trouble because the goal was to get the island of Ireland. Do you remember what Yeats understood? Do you remember the difficulty, the problem of having potential idealistic dreams, which are really good for motivating people, and really good for giving people the impetus to go towards the future? But then once you get to that future, real decisions have to happen. Tactile processes have to go into place and consolidated victories and sacrifices and trade-offs need to happen in order to make the vision come true. And we don't know exactly how the vision is going to be born. And so Michael Collins was presented with this compromise. It wasn't the vision that most people had. It was a sort of kind of halfway there vision, a first step in the right direction vision. People don't like that. An enormous amount of will had been built up and spent to put the British in this position of danger and compromise that the Irish had got them in. And they wanted it all. But now Michael Collins only took a little bit. But Michael took the deal. And this set off a cascade that sent Ireland into civil war. Because now the Irish themselves began to fight each other for the vision. The wrong vision versus the right vision. We want the whole island and we want to keep fighting versus we'll take what we can get. And this led to a nasty civil war which ended in Michael Collins getting shot. Now he might have been assassinated by his rival Eamon de Valera. There's a lot of names to be thrown out. But he, Eamon de Valera, became our first president. He became the man who finally took the republic and had it in his hands, consolidated power, and was able to transform Ireland into a new vision. He was the first leader to give Ireland a destiny, to enact and consolidate a vision. And he may have got there by shooting Michael Collins, but nonetheless, this is how the messy reality of history works. Finally, after a long process, centuries in the making of suffering, of stress, of pain, of the beginnings of this notion of Irish independence, Irish separation, gradually cascading into this strong, romantic, visionary dream of a united, free Ireland, finally leading to this cascade of violence and political animus and sharp teeth and pointed energy, All these sacrifices, these shooting and executions of these great men, these assassinations, the blood in the streets, the civil wars, the attacking, the fighting, the guerrilla wars, all of this, so much labor and stress, sacrifice, pain, death, murder, blood, bones broken, damage and danger, efforts by poets, it all consolidates in this one man who takes power and his cabinet, Eamon de Valera. They're the people who reap the harvest for all of this and is his opportunity to do something now with the free Republic of Ireland that he has won now, that his people have won for him off the British Empire. And what's so interesting and endearing is that the vision that de Valera enacts after gaining all of this political capital and will and here comes the moment when we are free and we get to decide who we are. Now is the hard part. He decides to enact that vision from the 19th century, that romantic ideal. This is the power of the poets, do you understand? He enacts that romantic ideal of Ireland as a gentle, agrarian society, full of greenery, full of cows, full of milk, not full of potatoes, screw them fucking things, and everybody chilling out and being happy. Everybody, you know, not involved with the nonsense of politics, just living in a healthy land with a healthy population, who all speak Gaelic, who all learn about the traditional music and all drink milk and go down to the local dance parlor and meet their girl and are Catholic. They have this beautiful Catholic church that gives them their religion, this beautiful traditional music that gives them their soul, and he has these beautiful cups of milk that gives them their strong bones and massive brains and weird shaped heads. And there you go. 
Tradcath Utopia is created and it's full of Irish people. What more could you want? And it was a wonderful realization of the vision. When I think about my youth growing up, I grew up around farmlands and fields. I grew up in William Wordsworth's imagination. You know, I grew up in the idyllic land of the, the cold, wet, rainy fields. I had endless, endless gallons of milk flowing into the house all the time. We are very healthy people these days. We've got quite a lot of intellectual capital. We're all strong, tall, good looking people. We're doing very well for ourselves, all because of the attitudes that these people had back then. A lot of things went right, but there were many problems. The De Valera regime was conservative to a fault. Ireland, as a consequence, actually started to stifle in terms of its cultural output. There were years during the 1950s, even a stretch of years, I believe, that something like 15 books was published. And there was this ruthless censorship regime put into place to try to consolidate the power and make sure the vision was all going to plan. And on top of that, Ireland stayed very, very poor. Right up until the 1990s, Ireland was basically stone broke, man. We had nothing going for ourselves. We were trad and agrarian. We had our farmland. We had, I guess, our health, you know, but we did not have cash. You see, this is the thing, this is the way big boys think, is that everything comes in trade-offs. It's very hard to get everything right, and you go to a hardcore, traditionalist, old-school, Catholic, romantic vision of the past, and then it is beautiful. It will keep you healthy, keep your community together, keep your identity strong, but it does come from trade-offs. Crippling poverty, a lot of emigration out of Ireland, a lot of people left Ireland, a strangling of creativity, of even artistic and cultural works, perhaps even innovation itself. But it is what it is. Some vision had to be put into place. And Dev was the man who received that moment in history and set us up for where we are now. But something happens at this point that will bring us back to an original trend that we observed. The idea of the reaction coming against the previous age. Just like the Romantic movement being, in some sense, a reaction to the stiff, staunch, rationalist movement. You see now the De Valera's traditional, grounded, down-to-earth Ireland starts to experience a bit of a reaction from the later generations that come out of it. De Valera dies in the 60s and Ireland begins to experience the start of its process of Californication. Finally, the Americans figure out a way that they can break the Shire, they can break into the Hobbit land and start to influence us. And they realise that tanks and aeroplanes won't do the job. Burgers and Hollywood is the path towards the Irish soul. And so through the television and the radio, us Irish begin to see the glamorous world of America filter through. The classy, gorgeous people in the Hollywood movies, the stylish and fun rock and roll music, the free-thinking, sexually liberal hippies, and all the wealth and capitalism that goes along with that. And we start to look at ourselves as inferior. We start to derive our value systems from this new form of media that comes in. And we start to anchor our cultural identity in in these value systems. And through this media and these art forms, the 1960s civil rights counterculture begins to filter into Irish consciousness. And our value system and our identity and way of seeing ourselves begins to move away from these old conservative revolutionary principles. This idea of us winning this free country for ourselves. That actually starts to get faded into the distance and the reaction comes where people want to escape from this. And the best way that you can understand that is by looking at one of our most famous musical acts of all time, U2, and their lead poet, Bono, who is a fantastic poet. But he presents himself as a new type of Irish person, as an Irish man who wants to move away from the petty anger and revolutionary instincts of the past, the resistance of the past. And he wants to rise up and move towards higher ideals. He wants to progress forwards into a new vision and a new dream. This starts to become a big motif. And he's very much a representative of the general trend that Irish culture was following along with. 
You see, the world Bono grew up in was 1970s, 1980s Dublin, which was full of heroin addicts. It was like the fentanyl or opioid crisis going on in America right now. There was a lot of drug dealing violence, gang violence and street violence in Dublin. It felt like a very petty place. It was extremely poor. It was backwards. They had missed out on the whole progressive 1960s revolution that was going on in England and America. And it felt like a terrible place overall. Worse still, was the IRA was now essentially a terrorist group operating as people who dealt these drugs and stimulating sectarian violence that at this point had completely burned out from its previous rev revolutionary ideals and now simply appeared as this sort of petty group of criminals that were hassling people and civilians all around the island. And of course up north there was dense, hard troubles going on with a lot of deaths and a lot of pain and a lot of people dying. And so what you will notice in Bono's poetry is this reactionary romanticism, this calling to escape from the pettiness, this resistance, this rejection of this revolutionary instinct. One of their most famous songs is Sunday Bloody Sunday, and listen to what Bono says at the start of this live performance. He makes the statement that this is not a rebel song. He is throwing away that categorization. He no longer wants to participate in that cultural identity. He sees himself as a part of a new type of Irish culture. This song is not a rebel song. This song is Sunday, bloody Sunday. I won't heed the battle call. There's many who have lost, but tell me who has won. Sunday, bloody Sunday. How long, how long must we sing this song? How long, how long, how long, how long, how long? He's given out stink here. He's saying that it's gone on too long. The come down has come in. The hangover has kicked in. This revolutionary idealism that won us this great country of ours, it's gone on now for 50 years at this point. Are people just butchering each other? And Bono's sort of feeling and signaling that this pettiness, this low-mindedness is not good. He doesn't want to participate in this. He feels himself being called towards things that are bigger, higher ideals. These, this idea of oneness. You'll notice this motif now in his, his poetry overall. This idea of oneness and love and higher ideals. He's very much a staunch Christian, which is interesting. He's like, you know, Christian 50s conservatism, but this is like a new sort of globalist style Christian. He's a very interesting representation of this Christian platonic idealism. Escape into the grand ideals and move away from the this nastiness and pettiness that holds us down, the heaviness and the density and the violence and all this. And he models, models himself in some type of political activist, you know, like Bob Marley or Martin Luther King or Mahatma Gandhi. He's this character standing up there calling for these higher ideals, being brave to turn around and say, I don't want to participate in this nonsense. I want to overcome this. I want us to unify together and, you know, learn the Christian virtues of forgiveness and allow ourselves to turn the other cheek and develop a higher consciousness, a higher love. 
that makes us understand that all this stuff is bad. It's spitting, rejecting, turning around, saying no, no to everything that came before, no to all that animus, all that energy that one Ireland and gave gave him the freedom to say stuff like this. He's rejecting that stuff. And of course, you can understand it. It might be easy for us to say, well, that's awful, Bono, just throwing something like this away. But he lived through it. I didn't. I wasn't even born when he was doing this. But he lived through hearing stories about people losing their hands, people losing their feet. I've met people whose uncles are have crutches now or have like are missing limbs because they got into their car and there was a fucking Molotov cocktail in the in the bonnet or something like that. And when they sh- turned on the ignition, it like burned all the skin off their arm or something like this. I know people like this, and it's it's not a joke when you see this. You know, it's it's all cool and romantic and badass being a revolutionary until you come across somebody who's you know missing half their face or uh, they have a they, you know they they have a permanent limp because the part of their their kneecaps were blown off or they don't, don't have any upper teeth because they got a uh, curb stomped you know that's a real serious thing and so as bono and u2 their career progresses they actually start to embody this very idea the ideal of the irish man with his big soul escaping the pettiness escaping these small-minded nationalists who are romanticizing this stupid stodgy past and romanticizing this sort of Ireland that turned out to be nothing more than a conservative shithole that was all poor and didn't really achieve anything that it promised. He's not about that anymore. He's about shedding off all that dead weight and joining the universal principles, the bigger world. And he goes off to America, which is a bigger world, a world of possibility, a world of idealism. He wants to go into that and live an actual destiny and a life of idealism. He wants to become something bigger than just some petty, squabbling nationalist, graveling and grubbling on about crumbs at the, the side of the table or something like this. He has this hope towards a larger dream. Looking for your money, looking for your voice. like when we watch the arc of Yates career we can watch a similar evolution happen in Bono's career as he starts as trying to be the voice of reason within the context of petty little Ireland and he actually graduates and moves and evolves into being a sort of voice of the globalist project of modernity he goes on to celebrate these big ideas about world peace and oneness he pretty much separates himself from Ireland almost entirely and becomes a voice of all the nations he becomes a massive political activist on the world stage he participates in things like Live Aid which is a really big thing for the boomers where they're doing this concert to raise money to help a famine in Africa he becomes really caught up in this whole new consciousness that arrives out of the 1960s and at the end of the 20th century a new vision the 
global world vision. We as this world family, these higher ideals of world peace, these petty nationalist notions getting thrown behind the revolutionary instincts the fascism and conservatism of the past all that stuff is dead weight that we are shedding off we're lifting up into a higher consciousness a rejection of the past a rejection of the the old order and an ascendancy of new idols new ideals new dreams and as a consequence of this, the Irish have, in some sense, rejected Bono. Bono is a figure of derision and mockery over here now. People present him as pompous, as arrogant, as stuck up. He's gone off and he's talking about charity all the time and talking about this higher idealism. And you can actually kind of understand, from his perspective, what that might look like. It might look like this petty, crab-in-the-bucket attitude trying to pull him down as he tries to reach towards the higher values, the higher laws, the higher goals, and to preach a big message in a big story, something that is epic, something that is defining mankind and giving it a purpose and a destiny, something that's climbing much, much higher than the petty squabbles that you see in the day-to-day -day life of most people. And as a consequence of this, Bono has spent much more of his later career cultivating a strong American audience, a global audience, but he really loves the Americans because the Americans are naturally idealistic. They naturally respond to these big hopes and these big dreams. It's something in their nature that the Americans are romantic in, in their soul. Wit? What do you mean there's a small country in South America without freedom, without democracy, without women's rights? Let's fucking nuke it. And this was the boomer era, the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, all the way up into the noughties. And finally leading us into our age in the 2010s, now into the 2020s. And now something fascinating is happening because the reaction is coming once again. Many of us are looking at these boomers like Bono that have received our nations and received the world from our ancestors who fought in these revolutionary periods. And we are questioning their idealism and their dreams and their goals. We're stuck in this perpetual samsara of always reacting against the path, rebelling against our forefathers. We now look at these boomer civil rights activists like Bono and Sinead O'Connor, who are very talented poets and really did give a voice to the generation that was authentic, and you can't get mad at them for doing that. But we look at this and say that was wrong. We don't agree with that. Our generation is now flirting once again with traditionalism with conservatism, with romanticizing the return to nature, the contraction away from these globalist ideals, and the return to living on the land and living as a farmer, to not participating in these grand political projects, which we now categorize as woke, and we generally see as being possessed by some type of mental disorder. Our generation now looks at Bono consciousness and the idols that he stacked up as gobbledygook, as extremely unwise, as something that is not correct to focus as a vision for the future. We are in reactionary war against that specifically. And in some sense, this danger is very real. An awful lot of this boomer consciousness involves these ideas of transforming all of the cultures in the world into this big homogenized block where we mass immigrate people from all across the world and replace the population of Ireland with some type of multicultural diversity, which is obviously going to destroy Irish culture. We do this then, of course, to London, to Paris, to Germany, to Spain, to America. And what do you really have left at the end of that? Nothing. Nothing original and real comes out of this. This is the sort of end game of the globalization project, the end game of these universalist ideals that were celebrated in the civil rights movement in the 1960s. These men like Bono labored their entire lives to participate in this grand vision of an open society, of a grand global world where everybody can flow together and people are judged on their high idealism and the, their ability to, you know, prattle on about these beautiful morals that Bono liked to ac operate as an activist for, but we reactionaries, we young millennials, we young Zoomers, we're turning around and doing something quite harsh. We're saying your vision is wrong. You have not dreamed the right dreams. The vision and destiny you have for us and our world is not one that we want to fulfill. And now it sits on us. 
Now it is our task as we become the dominant generations. Us millennials and us Zoomers are going to inherit the world in the next 10 and 20 years. And it will be on us to make those hard decisions about what the future of our world should be, what the future of Ireland should be, what the future of whatever nation we are from should be, and of course our Western culture as a whole. And there's an awful lot that we need to learn in order to make good decisions. Because you'll notice that an awful lot of what is happening in this story is these reactions, this ping-ponging between different positions. Is there anybody who's ever really sat down and been able to get a clear-headed view of these monstrous and massive trends and say to themselves, what truly is the right values that we should hold? How do we create a great culture? What type of values must we instantiate at the ground level to make sure this great culture blossoms? Will we forever be trapped in this reactionary spiral between progressing into globalized, identityless McDonald's land or conservative, broke, poor, backwards land? Is there any way that we can achieve something that is a true romantic idealism? This is, of course, what Friedrich Nietzsche was trying to educate us to do when he asked us to learn to be dynamic with our understandings of values. But alas, this will too quickly turn into a Nietzsche rant, and I'm sure you've heard enough of them from me. And to sign off, I will say, Hail Biden, Ireland must get a nuclear weapons program, and within 150 years, every planet in this solar system will be green. Irish, Gaelic, Celtic, Galactic Empire, until the end of time. I'll talk to you later, people. Bye-bye. <laughs>